What's up guys? So in this video, we're going straight into transistors and transistor-based circuits and how to drive those transistors in order to drive a flyback and get some high voltage. Now, if you haven't seen part one of this series, I suggest you do so, so you get uh, a basic understanding and also introduction to all of this. Now, without further ado, let's get straight into it. So like I mentioned, power transistors are hard to drive, and after some failed experimentation, I thought why not check out the circuit diagrams of actual cathode ray tube TV boards to see how the real electrical engineers designed these flyback transformer drivers. And as I knew most, if not all, of these boards use power transistors for the drivers. And I didn't specifically look for the schematics for the circuit boards I had on hand because I just wanted to look at a few schematics in general and see if I could notice anything interesting. So if you zoom closer in on the schematic, you'll see a transformer right here that's labeled FBT. That stands for flyback transformer. That's how we know this transformer is the flyback transformer. Another way to identify that this is the flyback transformer is that you can see um, internal diodes that rectify the high voltage. Now if we go down here and if you place your focus on pin 2 and 1 uh, you'll see that on this line is 195 volts and that's a DC and it's coming in going through the flyback and it's going all the way over to the switch to this transistor and this transistor is actually being switched by this isolation transformer now this isolation transformer is actually being driven by, you guessed it, another switch, right? But this one is easier to drive. It's smaller. It's like a jelly bean transistor. The transistor that is actually driving our flyback is over here, and, and it's on the other side of the isolation transformer. It's much beefier, and it's harder to drive. But what I want you to get out of this diagram is basically that to drive the power transistor, they are using this isolation transformer. And not only is it providing isolation from this low voltage side to this high voltage side, and this isolation transformer has enough turns in it in such a way to provide enough current to the base of this power transistor in order to drive the load, which is the flyback in this case. Uh, again, not only we're providing isolation with this transformer, but we are providing enough current to the base of this transistor, and so it's, you know, doing double duty right here. And if you follow this line from the small transistor all the way back, it will lead you to a microcontroller. Now there's more I can say about this diagram, but I want to move on and show you other diagrams like this. All right, so this is a different schematic, and right here we see another flyback transformer, and you can tell by the internal high rectification diodes. Uh, if you would look at pin 10, you would see on this line is 180 volts, and it's also labeled high voltage. Uh, you follow it all the way down, where my cursor is, and then you go down here and you see that it's at the collector side of this transistor and it's um, and it's very beefy transistor over here that's actually connected to this isolation transformer. And guess what the isolation transformer is connected to on the other side? Well, this small transistor that's switching it. And so here, again, you see the same configuration to drive the flyback. So yet again, we're looking at a different schematic, and it says FBT up here, if you can make that out. This is a very low-resolution photocopied uh, version of the schematic, and uh, I think it's an older schematic anyway. But you can make out the flyback transformer here, and also just because it has those internal high voltage rectification diodes. And if you would focus on pin 1 over here where my cursor is, and just follow that all the way down, all the way down to this transistor, right? And we see that the flyback um, is being switched by this transistor. This transistor is being switched by, yet again, a isolation transformer. And this isolation transformer is being switched by this little transistor right here, yet again. So we see, we keep seeing the same pattern, uh, the same configuration of this big transistor being uh, switched by this uh, isolation transformer and the isolation transformer being switched by this little transistor. Now if you go back to the flyback transformer, there's another interesting detail that might surprise you. So if you look at pin 2, and pin 2 is connected to pin 1, but um, through the inductive coil, right? And so we follow pin 2, 
and pin 2 has 115 volts on it, right? That's what is being switched to drive the flyback. Um, it is going down here and going past the transistor and let's see it's connected over here I believe this is a resistor and another resistor and it's going into the isolation transformer now uh, this is an interesting detail uh, just because that this isolation transformer can be custom made um, to be fed any type of voltage and the voltage on the other end where the beefier power transistor is is going to be lower obviously but because the voltage is starting out high and is ending up very low you have a lower voltage with a much higher current as a result and that higher current as you know is very important in driving a power transistor so after looking at all those schematics online, I went ahead and took an actual circuit board that I have and uh, looked at all the traces and figured out the reverse engineered uh, circuit. You can see that this circuit is pretty much identical, the same to all those online circuits that I showed you. So I'm not going to really explain the circuit, so you can pause if you want to study all the values over here. But there's one thing I do want to explain, and that is the isolation transformer. And since we know uh, what is going into that, tr since we know the values that are going into the isolation transformer, uh, we can sort of roughly calculate the amperage and the volts that are coming out on the secondary. Now one of the first things I do is I take the resistance measurements of the primary and secondary. Now uh, this correlates to the amount of turns on the primary and secondary and it is a very rough value so keep that in mind. I ignore the 15 to 1 ratio by the way, that just, just ignore that. The reason I'm using the resistance values instead of the actual turns on the primary and secondary is because simply I just can't find the exact number of turns on the primary and secondary anywhere. I can't find a schematic or, or a data sheet for the isolation transformer or it turns out that well you either make your own transformer or you just use a random transformer most of the time and you don't want to spend all that time searching and searching just to get the turns. So as a very rough value, very rough uh, ratio to work with uh, in your calculations, you can just take the resistance measurements. At least that's what I do. Maybe that's not the proper way of doing it, but you know, with the, all the random transformers I work with, it just saves time. Also, these values depend on how accurate your multimeter is at measuring resistances, so keep that in mind too. Anyway, once I have the known values, which is the voltage and the resistance that is going to the primary, I can figure out how many amps are at the primary, right? And then, because I have a nice ratio number to work with, I can multiply that ratio number by the amount of amps on the primary to get a good idea of how many amps will be on the secondary. I can also do this with the voltage and just taking the ratio value, dividing it by 115 volts, and I get 1.5 volts. Now, I have to stress that these values are very rough approximations. But it is a good way to get an idea of the numbers and values needed to drive this uh, power NPN transistor. So this is the very simplified schematic or circuit that um, I built to drive this power NPN transistor to drive this flyback. And as you can tell, it uses that isolation transformer. Now the most significant thing I can say about this circuit is that the resistor up here, the value of this resistor will depend on what kind of isolation transformer you use and also what kind of voltage you are putting into it. So starting off with the microcontroller, uh, it goes into the base of this transistor, so it controls this transistor. That transistor is a BD135 medium power NPN transistor and is easily switchable by the microcontroller. So it doesn't have to be this specific transistor. Any small transistor that's easily switchable by your microcontroller will do. I also have a diode across the collector and emitter of that NPN transistor just to prevent it from inductive spikes from the isolation transformer. The isolation transformer is right there. If it will focus, 
the 27 volts from this power supply is going through that isolation transformer and then it's going into the collector of this transistor. The current from the power supply is being limited by this 160 ohm resistor over here and it's a pretty big wattage resistor just because it does get warm. Now this isolation transformer is not being used for its intended purpose, meaning I just took this random ferrite transformer out of a random PCB that I had. This big power transistor is a C5449 horizontal deflection transistor. And this power transistor is of course switching the voltage that I put in through the flyback. And that's, you know, pretty much it. The only catch here is how to properly choose a isolation transformer to provide the necessary voltage and current in order to drive the NPN transistor properly. My oscilloscope is connected between the emitter and the base of the transistor and this is the waveform that we see. We are at 0.5 volts per division and you can tell that the waveform is barely a volt. Because our transistor needs 1.5 volts to start turning on, I don't think this will be enough to turn on the transistor because it's barely one volt. Now I changed the current limiting resistor from 160 ohm to 55 ohm and this is the resulting waveform. Now more current is allowed to flow and we can see that the waveform now actually reaches one volt. So I'm going to test it with the flyback and see if we can get any arcs. Yeah, we are getting arcs. Very weak arcs. Yep, those are very weak arcs. As you can imagine, the transistor is not being switched on properly. And so very little current going through and just weak arcs in general. What? What do you want? Why are you down here? Come back here. You want to go outside? Meow. That's right. So I'm going to try something different now. The board that you see in front of you was recently extracted from a working TV. So I know this entire board works and therefore all the components on the board should work too. And from here I'm going to extract the power transistor, the isolation transformer, the jelly bean transistor, and a few other components like a current limiting resistor. I wanted to do this all from the same board because usually the components like the jelly bean transistor, the isolation transformer, and the power transistor are all picked to work nicely together. And to increase our chances of success with using an isolation transformer to drive the power transistor, well, this would be probably the best course of action to extract all of the components off the same board because we know that they should work all together nicely. All right, so this is the setup that I have now. And we have the microcontroller switching this C2331 NPN jelly bean transistor. Uh, that can handle up to 80 volts. And this is one indicator that we're not working with high voltage here. Um, if this can only support a low voltage like 80 volts, that usually means that the isolation transformer that we're using um, cannot handle that high voltage either. So it most likely won't take 120 volts or 130 volts DC like the other isolation transformers that I've tried. 
Now I know from looking at the board itself there were some capacitors on there that were actually connected to the primary of this isolation transformer and the maximum voltage for those capacitors was 25 volts. Now that capacitor voltage value actually is a good upper limit of the voltage that we can try to get to with this variac. So this basically means that I'm not going to exceed 25 volts DC on this variac, but even below 25 volts, we should see that the signal on the secondary of the isolation transformer would be somewhere around 1 to 1.5 volts, uh, and that would be driving the base of this power transistor. So we're going to have a voltage of 25 volts coming from the variac. That's going to be filtered by a full bridge rectifier. So that connection goes to these resistors and this is just one big resistor that's 330 ohms approximately. And this is copying the resistance that I saw on the board itself. So past these resistors, the voltage goes into the transformer and then goes all the way over to the collector side of this jelly bean transistor. So after looking at the circuit board again, I realized the resistance values I was using was kind of off. So I replaced that 330 ohm resistor with this 33 ohm resistor. And I also put a 47 microfarad capacitor in line with the isolation transformer to smooth out the waveform. So we're working with a C5386 power transistor here. According to the data sheet, this transistor starts saturating at 1 volt typically, but the maximum would be 1.5 volts. So hopefully we should see 1.5 volts or somewhere close to that when we activate the circuit. Now let's go to the oscilloscope and observe the waveform. Well, we're at 26 volts DC from the variac, and we're at 0.5 volts per division on the oscilloscope, and this is the best waveform that I could possibly get. It's a little disappointing, actually, because we're not even at 1 volt. Uh, if we go to 0.2 volts per division, you can see that the very peak of this waveform is at 0.8 volts. And I honestly don't know if that's enough to saturate the transistor because the data sheet was telling me that the typical value for saturation for this specific transistor is 1 volt. And we're not even at 1 volt. But I'm also starting to think that the designers for this circuit intentionally made it this way so the transistor doesn't turn on too much and destroy itself from, you know, switching high current. So maybe this switching waveform is intentional, but honestly, I'm not sure. What I'm going to do right now is put some protection circuits on the power transistor, and then we'll test this waveform with the flyback all the way to 120 volts and see if the performance from the flyback is satisfactory. God, it's f scary. Wow, that is so much current. Holy sh**. The transistor is actually pretty warm. I don't think I'm comfortable going further. 
Now obviously you are not limited to using that isolation transformer to turn on and off the power transistor. There are various other methods that you can use and some of those methods I will be briefly going over right here. One such configuration that can amplify current is a comment collector or an emitter follower. If you remember me mentioning that you could put a load on the emitter side of a transistor, well, in this configuration, it's actually advantageous because it amplifies current to drive a bigger load. The Darlington configuration is just basically two transistors that are connected in such a way that the current amplified by the first one is further amplified by the second. So this gives a large current gain that is useful in driving bigger loads. One disadvantage of this configuration is that since you're turning on two transistors, you usually have a higher threshold voltage and it's common to have a threshold voltage of two volts or more. One thing about this configuration is that it just acts as one big transistor. So usually you can find this configuration in just a single package or you can make this configuration with discrete parts. Another circuit you can try is called a push-pull driver or a push-pull circuit. Now these circuits are commonly found in audio applications and you will commonly see a circuit like this that uses an NPN and a PNP transistor in series across the power supply. The same circuit can be made with an N-channel and a P-channel MOSFET. If you want a good demonstration of the push-pull circuit in action, I would recommend going to Electroboom's website or channel and checking out his video or schematic of the push-pull driver he made for his subwoofer. And since we're talking about transistors, let's not forget about the very popular and simple single transistor flyback driver. Now what I want to do with the circuit is first build it check its performance, and then try to improve it as best as we can. So here's how the circuit looks like roughly. There's the transistor mounted on this aluminum plate. Now I just drilled four holes in this plate to make room for the top and bottom screws and for the transistor leads to go through the aluminum plate. I also added a thermal pad and some heat shrink tubing to the electrodes of the transistor to make sure everything's isolated. Now the green resistor over here that you see is a 33 ohm resistor and the white blocky resistor that you see is a 270 ohm resistor. So the values of these resistors don't have to be exact, at least for this transistor. So these two wires connect to the primary and the primary has three turns on it. These two wires connect to the feedback coil and they also have three turns on the winding. And make sure that the windings are wound in the same direction or else the magnetic fields will cancel each other out and you just won't have high voltage. All right, so now I'm going to turn the circuit on and we won't go to full power yet, but I just want to show you that it works. All right, now let's go to the oscilloscope and let's see the waveforms. All right, so I connected my oscilloscope to the base and the emitter of the transistor and we're at one volt per division on the oscilloscope. Now I'm going to turn on the circuit and keep it at six volts. Anyway, the more important part of seeing this waveform is noticing just how much transient voltage is going negative. Look how much negative voltage we have. So to solve that negative voltage problem on the base and emitter of this transistor, I'm going to simply attach a diode between the base and emitter. All right, there you go. Now let's see the resulting waveform on the oscilloscope. Now the waveform looks much better you can see that the negative spikes that we once saw were very large are now very tiny. Now I wanna check the voltage on the collector and emitter of the transistor. So I connected my probe up to those points and let's see the waveform on the oscilloscope. All right, so this is the waveform that we see. We're at five volts per division and between the collector and emitter, we see five, 10, 15 volts, probably above 15 volts on the collector emitter. If we go up to 20 volts, actually 50 volts per division, and then we turn up our intensity, we can see we have voltage up here. We're at 50 volts per division, and this is going upwards of 100 volts on the collector and emitter. What the hell is going on? What is this?
Well, these are the transient voltages that we get from switching the flyback. Now the transistor that we're using can only handle 60 to 70 volts max on its collector and emitter. So how is it surviving right now? Well, first of all, if we turn down our intensity, we can see that those transients basically disappear, meaning that they're very weak voltages. They don't have a lot of current behind them. But that's not to say they can't still hurt the transistor. Over time, transients can definitely hurt the transistor. So what can we do about it? Well, we can place this 104 capacitor across the collector and emitter, and we can smooth out all those transients. All right, we're at 20 volts per division, and you can immediately see a big difference. If I turn up the intensity, you can see that we see nothing except this waveform, and it's well within the range of the operating voltage on the collector and emitter. So now that we have successfully protected our transistor from transient voltages and negative voltage spikes, we can comfortably go up to the maximum 12 volts and get some nice high voltage out of this circuit. Now the thing about this specific circuit is that it all revolves around the transistor. Now this transistor is easy to drive and can handle a lot of current, but cannot handle a lot of voltage on its collector and emitter. Like I said, it was only 60 to 70 volts max. And the thing is, when you give the circuit 12 volts, you're approaching 60 to 70 volts uh, on the collector and emitter. And that's why if you go above 12 volts, well, it's very likely that this transistor will just burn out because it can't handle the voltage above 60 to 70 volts on its collector and emitter. And you might be thinking, well, if you're reaching the voltage limit for the collector and emitter, why not just use a bigger capacitor over the collector and emitter to smooth out that voltage more? And while you can do that, and it does work, what it also does is degrade arc performance. Well, if you want a longer arc, using a smaller capacitor gives you the best performance. Using a bigger capacitor actually shortens that arc, but makes it a little bit thicker. So basically what I'm saying is that at 12 volts, we're reaching the limitations of this transistor. And if you want bigger arcs or longer arcs with this setup, with this circuit, then you're going to have to find a transistor that can handle more voltage on its collector and emitter. This C5449 transistor can handle up to 700 volts on its collector and emitter, but the disadvantage with this transistor is that it's also very hard to drive. Let's see if we can make this transistor work with this circuit. All right, I got some good news and I got some bad news. The bad news is, these types of transistors suck for this circuit. And there's two main reasons for that. The way they are constructed in order to withstand higher voltages, and because of the fact that they require a higher base current, up to one amp, in order to saturate. Making them harder to drive, of course, but also making them harder to oscillate in the circuit. I'm not saying it's impossible to make these things oscillate with this circuit. I actually wanted to find an answer to this question and see if I could even get this uh, guy to oscillate in this circuit. So I wound a flyback transformer with all of these windings and then I just tested different configurations of windings to see if the transistor would oscillate in those different configurations. And it so happens that it did oscillate in a certain configuration, but no matter what I changed or what I did, the performance of the arc was very poor. And on top of changing the configuration of windings, I also had to change the resistor values to much lower ones, and therefore I was dissipating a lot of heat and it was also making the transistor very hot too. So honestly, this circuit is only good for transistors that are easy to drive. So I'm talking about transistors that require maybe a few milliamps at their base in order to start saturating. So to demonstrate that, I took off the 2N3055 transistor and I replaced it with this transistor. This is a BD135 transistor and I did find this transistor on a board and extracted it. This transistor is also easy to drive and the performance that it puts out is actually amazing. Also, keep in mind we're using the same valued resistors from the original circuit. For the windings, we're using two turns for the primary and two turns for the feedback. So this is gonna be at 12 volts.
I would say that's pretty impressive performance coming from a small transistor like this. I think that's most of the stuff that I wanted to talk about. But if there's one thing that I hope you get out of this video, is that different transistors have different needs in order for them to switch on and off properly. These needs or requirements can make your circuit perform better or worse as a result. That's why looking at the data sheet is so important, and that's also why having an oscilloscope is also very important, to know if your switch is switching like it should. Whether it be driving a flyback or switching an LED on and off, it should be obvious that these are oscillator circuits, and oscillators are the heartbeat of electronics. What, you like electronics too? Do you like electronics? Whether it be power electronics, switch mode power supplies, or communication electronics, which involves high frequency circuitry, to even putting your food in a microwave that at the heart of it uses an oscillator to radiate electromagnetic energy into your food to heat up fats and water, oscillators are just f***ing everywhere. So what I'm saying is if you want to understand circuits like a flyback driver better, then researching oscillators would be a great idea. Why you do this? Why you do this? Why you do this? You interrupt my recording. Why you do this? <laughs> oh no, it fell off. <laughs> so you can go to Wikipedia and just go through all those oscillators that they have listed, but I'm going to list off a few of my oscillators that I've built and I really like. So the first one is the Mazali or Royer oscillator. It's also called a ZVS driver or ZVS circuit. ZVS stands for zero volt switching, and that just basically means that the MOSFETs in the circuit switch when there's zero volts across them. And so, so what that means for the circuit is that it's very efficient in switching large amounts of power. Now the next circuit is a Slayer Exciter Oscillator. Now this circuit is actually pretty cool, and I've even seen some circuits that use a Slayer Exciter for a Tesla coil, and then modify the circuit in such a way to inject music into it. So it's definitely one of those simple and nice circuits to play around with. A-stable multi-vibrators are also fun because they can be made out of discrete components and calculating the frequency is not too hard. The A-stable multi-vibrator is actually one of my favorite relaxation oscillators that uses specifically resistors and capacitors to make the circuit oscillate and not inductors like some other circuits. Another cool circuit is a blocking oscillator and actually you may be familiar with this if you ever built a jewel thief because jewel thieves actually use this oscillator. Another interesting oscillator is called an Armstrong oscillator or a Meissner oscillator. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. And it's one of the earliest inductor-based oscillator circuits. It was used in a radio receiver circuit, if I'm not mistaken. And actually, the single transistor flyback driver circuit that we actually went over and analyzed is a variation of the Armstrong oscillator. And another thing worth mentioning with these oscillators is that sometimes, not always, but sometimes, you can get away with substituting, say, a MOSFET with a transistor or a transistor with a MOSFET. So just keep that in mind, uh, but also keep in mind the limitations of doing that. And yeah, you know, I hope you learned something, and I'll see you in the next one.